Good afternoon, and welcome to the launch of Stefan Rankin's new book, uh, Private Governance and Public Authority, Regulating Sustainability in a Global Economy from Cambridge University Press. We're really glad to have you all joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm Matt Hoffman, professor in the Department of Political Science here at the University of Toronto, Scarborough, and co-director of the Environmental Governance Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. We've got a great event for you planned this afternoon, and we're glad to see, uh, so to speak, see so many colleagues and friends joining us today. This is great. Um, first, though, I'd like to begin, as we so often and appropriately do, with a, a land acknowledgement. The land acknowledgement is uh, particularly important to me today for this event, not only to acknowledge the specific peoples on whose traditional land we're meeting today, uh, especially the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River, but also because contributing to forging a more sustainable world, which is I think ultimately Stefan's aim with this book, is an issue that connects deeply to the settler indigenous people's relationship and our collective responsibility and relationship to this land and to future generations. Indigenous people face some of the most significant threats from unsustainable practices and many indigenous peoples are at the forefront of efforts and activism to address them. And I'm grateful for our opportunity to work on this land and have this event as an opportunity to think deeply about what it takes to improve the sustainability of our world. Now, okay, in terms of schedule though, so we're gonna get started here in just a moment. I'm gonna turn things over to Professor Peggy Cohn, who's the chair of the Department of Political Science at UT Scarborough for some opening remarks. And then we're gonna have a set of remarks about the book because that's why we're here. I'm gonna give an overview and then we have two great experts to provide commentary. Uh, professor Graham Ald from Carleton University and our own Professor Jessica Green, um, who is currently at APSA in virtual Denver, but by the magic of digital meetings is gonna join us in a little bit later. And after these remarks, we're gonna give Stefan a chance to uh, defend himself if we say too many mean things about the book. Um, but then we'll have a Q&A with all of you, uh, all of you at the seminar, and we're, we're going to actually close with a virtual toast, since we can't have a, a real reception in these pandemic days. So with that, let me, uh, let me turn things over to Peggy for some, for some welcoming remarks. Peggy? Thanks. Thank you very much, Matt, for organizing this event. And I would also like to thank the Monk School, and especially the Environmental Governance Lab, as well as everybody for attending this event. I'm really honored to be part of it because I think the publication of a scholarly book and especially of a first book is a huge accomplishment. It's a long process and it starts when a scholar is passionate about something, how governance works, how it could be better. So you need curiosity, but then you have to read everything that's been written about the topic. So you need to have a strong work ethic. And then you have to design a study to test your intuitions and to test received knowledge. So you need to have analytic skills. And then after that, the hard part starts. Now, this might not have happened to Stefan, but often you come to realize after all of this research that you may not yet fully understand the problem, that there's still limits to your knowledge and that the question turns out to be harder than you imagined. And so you need to develop new skills or to seek new perspectives in order to fully understand it. So you need to have courage and perseverance. But if you have all those things that, you, that I just described, and Stefan clearly does, then you can produce a truly outstanding book like Private Governance and Public Authority. So most of you who are gathered here today already know Stefan Rankins. So I'll just take a second to introduce him. He is an assistant professor in the political science department at UTSC. He holds a PhD from Yale. His research examines the development and impact of transnational private governance and global production processes. His work deepens our understanding of the interactions between public policy and transnational corporations. Did we lose you there, Peggy? 
Um, oh, I'm sorry. I thought that because the video turned out that like turned off that I had been entirely cut off of this. Nope. We're I'm still, sorry. We're <laughs> okay. Still live. So to return to my introduction, uh, my Zoom skills are still in progress here. Um, he, uh, Stefan Rankin studies environmental and natural resources policy and governance, including renewable energy, climate change, fisheries, forestry, electronic waste, agriculture, and sustainable fair trade. In the book project, Stefan examines the variation in the way that the European Union has regulated um, these things, and he has focused on private environmental governance in the European Union. According to Virginia Hoffler, and I quote, this book demonstrates why Stefan Rankins has quickly become one of the most significant scholars in the arena of global governance. So I'm honored to participate in this event, and I look forward to listening to the discussion. Thank you for coming. Great. Thank you so much, Peggy. That was wonderful. A great opening and, uh, and a nice tribute for Stefan. Um, so before I get going with, before we get going with the, the remarks on the book, I just want to remind people we're going to have Q&A at the end. And if you have questions, you don't have to wait until the end. You can use the Q&A function on Zoom to type those in, and we're going to be gathering them as we go, and uh, then we'll, we'll address them during the Q&A session. So you don't have to, you don't have to wait. Uh, you don't have to remember your questions. You can just type them in right away, and, and we have people that are going to be taking a look at them and, and getting them ready for the Q&A session. So, all right. So, this is why we're here. This is an excellent book, and you're going to hear lots about what makes it good and what, con what it contributes to, where it takes us, where it came from, things along those lines. Where we thought we'd start, though. I can certainly begin with my comments in the interim as we try to get uh, Matt back on the line. Um, Matt was going to provide some big picture context and overview of uh, Stefan's book, but obviously I can also provide remarks in that regard, as well as sketch out a couple of the things that I think, or a few of the things that I think are really important about the book and um, what it's done and where it points to for, for further research in this area. And this is obviously a real honor and a uh, great privilege for me to be on this line today because I have known Stefan for some time, uh, originally as grad students together at Yale. Um, and so it's really a pleasure to be able to speak about uh, the success of his first book. But I see Matt's back on the line, so I'll turn it back to him and then I'll, I'll pick up the mic again once Matt's uh, set the context. Yeah, so that was nice and embarrassing, a good way to, to do this. Of course, I'm not exactly sure what happened. I'm guessing my internet crashed, but I'm, I'm back. So unless, uh, Graham, unless you just gave the whole overview, I'll just jump back into where, to where I was. So, all right, so I'm not going to provide commentary so much on the book. That's uh, Graham and Jessica's job, but I do want to give everyone a sense of what the book says and what the book does, and, and hopefully this will help generate some, uh, some conversation and give some context to what Jessica and Graham are going to say. So at its core, Stefan's book is driven by, for my reading, an empirical puzzle and a theoretical lacuna. There are now private sustainability governance standards and processes everywhere, attempting or at least claiming to govern and steer corporations towards sustainability, right? Think of all the eco labels we have in the stores. You can find these things in a number of places. Think of all the claims about private governance or private authority changing or engaging with corporations to try and alter their behavior. Now this phenomena has piqued the interest of scholars and practitioners for the last decade or so, with interest in private governance and increasing in conjunction with the perceived and actual failures in multilateral and public attempts to address what is now acknowledged to be a sustainability crisis, not just a sustainability set of issues. Now, Stefan looks at private governance and sees a curious pattern. Sometimes states intervene in or work to regulate private governance, try and say, look, you guys regulating yourselves or NGOs regulating corporations isn't enough, and they step in and sometimes they don't. In the cases he looks at, the EU intervened heavily in private governance efforts around biofuels and organic agriculture, regulating the standards that private governance initiatives could set and how they could set them. 
On the other hand, the EU has refrained from regulating private governance efforts aimed at sustainability practices in fisheries or fair trade. So the EU clearly doesn't want to regulate private governance away or control how it functions in all cases. But sometimes public authority is brought to bear to shape how private governance will play out. Stefan book, Stefan's book asks why. This empirical puzzle, I think, is an instance of a more general theoretical puzzle about the interaction of public regulation and private governance. If private governance is a growing feature of sustainability politics and probably here to stay, how do the two forms of authority and governance interact and to what end? This theoretical puzzle puts Stefan right in the middle of a normative debate about private governance as well. Is it a transformational development that promises a new way to effectively rein in the excesses of capitalism and corporate behavior, pushing the world towards sustainability? Or is it an illusion, a failure of governance and a license for business as usual with a side of feel-good greenwashing to go along with it? Let me end the suspense. St if there is some. Stefan's book and careful study is not going to end that debate. But it does show through rigorous, thoughtful analysis that the interaction of public authority and private governance is neither a full re embedding of market actors within the public sphere, nor is it a full abdication of governmental responsibility to regulate the market. It's somewhere in between. And as this will satisfy neither the committed critics nor the committed proponents of private governance, I suspect that he actually means he's onto something important and he's probably right. What he argues and shows through compelling comparative case analysis is that the EU will intervene in private governance under certain conditions. And this can make private governance better, but not always. First, public authority will be brought to bear to help domestic producers take full advantage of private governance or to avoid the costs of private governance. Second, public authority will be brought to bear to level the playing field and help resolve the uncertainties and costs associated with the existence of and competition between multiple private governance schemes in a sector. Now I'm gonna leave the implications and contributions of this argument, this explanation for why there's different uh, public responses to private governance to Graham and Jessica and to Stefan himself. But I do wanna close by giving you some of the key conclusions that come from his finding about public authority and how public authority interacts with private governance. First, these public-private interactions legitimate private governance in important ways, solidifying the place of private governance in the politics of sustainability, for better or worse. Second, they also structure private governance and the motivations for restructuring for this public inter intervention into private governance, especially those motivations being aligned with domestic interests and the substance of restructuring, right? So it's not just that they intervene, that legitimates, but it changes the structure of, of private governance. And finally, we have to take seriously that private governance and public authority are co-evolving. The influence in the interventions are not just one way. Importantly, all three of these conclusions have significant implications for whether these public-private interactions are likely to enhance sustainability or continue with a somewhat disastrous status quo. Now, this overview that I just gave doesn't do full justice to the nuanced argumentation and rich empirical material in Stefan's book, but I hope it gives you some context again for the commentary that you're about to hear from, from Graham and Jessica. And so I'm going to turn things over first to, uh, to Graham, Professor Graham Ault. Uh, Graham is the director of the School of Public Policy and Administration at Carleton University. His research focuses on comparative environmental politics and policy, global environmental governance, and the rise of private governance and authority. Much of his work examines the formation, evolution, and impacts of non-state and hybrid forms of global governance across economic sectors. He's the author of an excellent book on private authority, Constructing Private Governance, The Rise and Evolution of Forest, Coffee, and Fisheries, as well as numerous articles on the subjects that I just, uh, just went over. He'll also be probably too nice to Stefan since some of those articles he co-authored with Stefan and he's known him for years. And so don't expect a lot of hard hitting, uh, 
yelling in this portion of the uh, of, of the book launch. But with that, Graham, the floor is yours. Thanks, Matt. Um, yes, definitely a big fan. So uh, um, that's that's my bias going into this. I, I'd also say that I think that uh, in this research agenda to um, to expand the time horizon slightly uh, reaches back several decades. Um, in, in truth, uh, my first intervention in this area was well back in the 1990s. So it's a uh, it's funny to see how much it's evolved and uh, how seriously this topic area is being taken now, which is uh, excellent. And the evolution of the of the research in this area and the the, the depth and um, impressiveness with which research is conducted in this space now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to highlight a few th key things that I think the book does really well. Uh, I'll, I'll just outline them now and then just go into a bit of depth um, on each of them. First, I think the really important contribution the book makes is to get us to think more seriously about unpacking what public interventions look like uh, in private regulatory uh, spaces. Um, the second is understanding the conditions that lead to those interventions, as Matt outlined the, the argument specifically. Taking seriously really this interaction between public and private and the the various features of that and what that means for um, the the implications and the consequences of private authority. Um, I think the fourth point uh, is Stefan's book really helps us understand private governance, not just as an institution, uh, a rule setting body, a regulator, but also as a political actor that seeks to influence the state um, to control and influence uh, the state's behavior vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the private governance space. And then finally, the, the final chapter in the book is, is just excellent in mapping out an agenda for further understanding public interventions, not only in the EU, but also at other levels uh, within the state, uh, domestic, subnational, and international. And I, I'll, I'll speak to those points just briefly at the end. But really, I want to start, come back to this sort of nature of public intervention. There's been a lot of work that sort of scratched the surface of how, how to understand public interventions in this space. And Stefan really helps us by getting us to start thinking about disaggregating what interventions look like and what that means for the logic of private authority um, and highlights how there's variation when we unpack it that way. And the, the, real, the, the real meat of the book focuses on this distinction between procedural and substantive uh, regulations from the state that uh, seek to influence the substance of the private rules and uh, regulations that seek to influence the, the procedures of uh, private regulation. And that, that I think is a really interesting insight and that maps directly on to Stefan's predictions or expectations about what kind of interventions you'd expect at an international level versus what kind of interventions you'd expect at a domestic level, which I think the final chapter is just excellent in mapping that out. And I, I look forward to uh, scholars who've already thought about these issues sort of taking uh, seriously Stefan's theories on, on that front. But I think the other thing that the that part of the book does so well is to highlight where the state isn't. And I think his insights, especially when we go back to uh, Ken Abbott and Duncan Snydell's work uh, in 2009 when they introduced the idea of orchestration, and really the premise of that piece in 2009 was to argue that um, there is all this decentralized uh, new governance, as they were describing it at the time, um, and this is really exciting. There's real opportunities here. There's strengths in decentralization, but there are certain things that it misses, and particularly those are things around democratic particip uh, participatory norms, uh, democratic uh, senses of legitimacy, and their their hook for the idea of what orchestration might do was actually to help private regulation do better on those things. And Stefan's book shows us that that's exactly not what the EU has done on these, on these issues. They haven't intervened on things like the diversity of stakeholder representation, participatory governance uh, in the model, other than providing some guidelines at a, at a general level at the EU level. So I think that's a really important point to hammer home that like the idea that the uh, academic literature has had for some time is that might be a role that the state has played, 
or could play. And in this case, a leading, um, in the case of the EU being a leader in this space has not sought to do that. So why is that? What's behind that? I think that that's an interesting puzzle that emerges from Stefan's book that uh, kind of hints at answers, but uh, there's much more there that could be explored. I'll leave aside the conditions point that I think is really key that Stefan's theory on, on the two variables, because Matt's laid those out. Um, I'll come back to them at the end when I talk about the sort of uh, the implications for further research. Uh, I think the other thing that the, those that haven't read the book that I think you could get a lot from reading Stefan's book is this, in, this public private interaction component, not the general point that that's happening because obviously that's been there for some time, but more the real nuance of how interventions by the EU in particular ways around say setting a baseline standard for organics on, on, on what organic agriculture means, but then allowing private standard setters to set higher standards, how those kinds of specific design features do or do not facilitate a particular logic of ratcheting up standards over time or create conditions that might actually lead to more of a race to the bottom. And the, the biofuels case versus organics has a really interesting um, story to tell about some subtle differences in design that are really important for that kind of interaction dynamic that, that I think a lot, a lot of us could learn from and think about in other cases. Um, my fourth point uh, that I want to highlight or wanted to highlight was this private governance as political actor. Um, Stefan's work is obviously pathbreaking in this regard. He's got other work on this, and this is not work with me, so I can really say this without any, uh, <laughs> any feeling of bias uh, whatsoever. Um, the work he does with me is great too, by the way, but uh, the work he does on his own is, is also great. Uh, it's just great. Um, the, the, this idea of, of reminding us that these, the emergence, there was a lot of attention in the literature on the emergence of these institutions and how they set rules and their functions as regulators. But Stefan uh, reminds us that once they're in place, they start to get interest and they start to have uh, interest vis-a-vis -vis the state and the continuation of their ability to operate. And, his attention to that function is really a key, uh, key contribution of the book and his other work has highlighted that as well. So the role of private regulators as lobbying the state for their particular interest that is a feature of the book, um, I think is a really key thing that will, will define the contribution of this book for, uh, for some time and, uh, and some of the other articles that, uh, that Stefan has come out uh, with on that topic. Finally, I think, uh, the, as I said, mapping an agenda for future understanding public interventions, this, this idea, this sort of this, the central idea being that uh, you'll more likely see it as substantive interventions by state regulating the substance of private regulation at a domestic or subnational level, and a more likely see procedural interventions at an international level is just an intriguing ending point of the book that he maps out a couple of cases where it shows it like holds quite well. Um, but I think that follow up work on Stefan's to understand that and, and probe further why that is and what that means for the kinds of division of labor in terms of the interactions of public and private, especially given the interest in questions like or processes like orchestration, um, I think is a really uh, an exciting um, dimension of the work that uh, I hope will come come out of uh, Stefan's book as as the sort of a, a research agenda in the area of public private interactions uh, in global governance. Those are my main points. Um, again, really a pleasure to be here and an opportunity to speak to Stefan's uh, work. I have a couple of questions, but I'll I'll leave those to after the uh, the, the remarks and uh, have a chance to discuss uh, the book with Stefan more uh, at that point. So, thanks again for this opportunity. Great, thanks so much, Graham. And uh, Jessica hasn't been able to join us yet. I actually know that. Uh, she was on an APSA panel, and I happened to notice on Twitter before we all logged on to here that her APSA panel got uh, Zoom bombed. And so it's, uh, it's 
very likely that that she's been delayed. And so we're going to have a little bit of a switch in the in the schedule. And I'm going to actually ask, we're going to we're going to sandwich Stefan in between his two commentators. And so, uh, Stefan, if you want to uh, to give, I won't. I know that you won't be able to respond right away to to Jessica's comments yet. We'll give you a chance to do that after she does hers. But if you want to to give us uh, your comments now, that would be great. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. And um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who is uh, joining us today during the launch of my book. I'm very excited that this uh, event is taking place. The book came out on uh, April 2nd, right at the start of the uh, almost global lockdown, which was a really weird time to celebrate um, a book being published. So I want to thank you all for being here, um, even though our lives have changed so much since uh, this book was published. Uh, in April. So I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank Matt and Peggy for their introductory remarks. I want to thank the Environmental Governance Lab for organizing this event and Graham, of course, for his great, great comments. <laughs> and um, hopefully Jessica is able to join us because I'm sure that she'll have some very insightful comments uh, as well. Um, to start with, maybe I'll just give a little bit of a background uh, to how I got uh, interested in this topic. And um, Graham already mentioned the cases of uh, biofuels production and organic agriculture, which are two of the issue areas I look at. Um, Matt mentions uh, fair trade, which is another issue area I look at. And the final, the fourth issue area that I look at is fisheries. Uh, private fisheries certification has been around since uh, the late 1990s. And the fisheries case for some reason has become so central to both the origins and the finalization of this book project. And the origins go back um, about 10 years ago when I was a grad student at Yale. And I was in Belgium in that summer, uh, 2010. And I had scheduled an interview with a representative from the Marine Stewardship Council, you know, one of the main private certification programs um, for fisheries products. And the interview was supposed to be in The Hague. So I go to Hague, to The Hague uh, the night before, you know, um, get myself a bed and breakfast. And that morning, the day after I go to the uh, MSC's office in The Hague, uh, I'm a little bit early, a little bit before 9, uh, 9 a.m. I'm there and there's nobody there. Okay, so I wait a little bit. Nobody shows up, this is quarter past nine, maybe even a, a little bit later. And uh, the MSC shared the building there with some other NGOs and some other people from those NGOs arrived. So I asked them like, do you have a contact uh, 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 information, some uh, phone number? from the, uh, the, the people from the MSC. And this was before I had a smartphone, so I couldn't quickly look up the, uh, the information on my smartphone. I had no internet access, so they give me a phone number. So I call the phone number, uh, I leave a message, a little bit later, the guy calls me back. Well, you know, I totally forgot about our meeting. I'm still in Rotterdam, where I guess he lived. Um, won't you be able to come to Rotterdam? I'm okay, it's not that far by train. So I jump on the train, but by that time, I'm a little bit annoyed with the guy, let's be honest. Because, you know, okay, so he forgot an interview with a grad student, fair enough. But I had to spend the night in The Hague. And let's be honest as well, you know, having spent the night in Rotterdam would have been a little bit more exciting than just spending the night in The Hague. So nonetheless, so I jump on the, on the train, it's not that far of a train ride. And so I meet him in the cafeteria of the Rotterdam train station. And we have a great, great talk. And at the time, I'm still really interested in the private governance side of things. Why do firms um, sign up to private governance programs? Uh, how does competition between different types of private uh, governance scheme work out? And how does that impact uh, public policy? So I already had that governmental or policy side in mind and maybe mainly looking at it from the perspective of private governance schemes. You know, if they set rules and standards around a certain issue area, does that uh, prevent governmental rules from emerging? That was the initial um, story or question that I had in mind. And then he tells me that the EU at that time is actually looking into um, regulating private governance schemes. And that kind of turned the question that I originally had in mind on its head, looking at it from the side of the public authority and how it can regulate or somehow control, you could call it orchestrate private governance regimes, supposedly to make them work better, or as I find in the end, uh, to a certain degree also support their local uh, economic actors. And so that's a little bit of the origins of the story. So the MSC uh, person really gave me a good 
starting point. And I remember being on the train back to Belgium from Rotterdam, jotting down all my thoughts because I was so excited. I had found my empirical puzzle. I already knew about the organics case. Now I had the MSC case. I was like, I have a puzzle. I just need to find some cases where the EU did not intervene and I have a perfect research design. And I was very excited about that because as a grad student, we're taught to look for empirical puzzles and then and there, this person from the MSC uh, handed it to me. So I was very, very happy with that. Now the fisheries case has also been somewhat of a uh, torture case for me because um, as I mentioned, private governance emerged in the 1990s. The EU starts a debate on what to do with this proliferation of uh, claims in the fisheries sector in, late 19, in the late 1990s already. Uh, early 2000, 2005, the EU officially starts a, uh, an official debate with a consultation, et cetera, on how should we deal with these private governance uh, schemes on fisheries. In 2008, 2009, the European Commission develops a formal proposal, formal legislative proposal to set um, procedural standards in this case, not necessarily define how sustainability in the fisheries sector should be defined because the EU was already doing that in its own common fisheries policy, but more about the procedural issues of private governance schemes. Nothing happens in the end. Uh, the EU starts a reform process of the common fisheries policy, uh, which uh, concludes in 2013. Originally, private governance regulation should have been a key component of that reform. Again, they postponed the decision. Nothing happened. So I finished my PhD uh, and the dissertation in 2014 without anything happening. Um, and I keep following the, uh, the issue and see how the commission might intervene in 2015. I'm back in Belgium. Uh, there's a, a public hearing at the European Parliament. You know, great speeches about how the EU should and could regulate. The EU um, issues a feasibility report, an official response by the commission to that report. And again, nothing happens. And I was kind of waiting to finalize the book because I wanted the EU decision on fisheries in the book. And in the end, nothing happened at all. And even to, up to the day, I just checked it yesterday, the same uh, information that was on the website two years ago is still there saying there was a 2016 report, the European Commission responded, and now it's up to the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers to do something with uh, the report of the Commission. And as far as that website is concerned, at least nothing happened in the meantime. So that case has been haunting me from the very origins of the book project up to today when still nothing uh, is happening. And um, it actually, it shows, it shows two things. Uh, one thing it shows uh, that when you're dealing with policymaking, it can go very slow. So don't necessarily wait if you want to do research on this and write a book, uh, especially uh, don't wait until the final decision is made because that final decision might never come. Uh, two, I think for graduate students, it's really interesting um, because those early um, interviews really helped me in finding my empirical puzzle, finding a way to structure um, the different cases that I already uh, knew about, uh, trying to find new cases that fit a certain uh, research design that I had in mind. And so those early interviews, even if you're still very unsure about what your concrete research topic will be, uh, can be very helpful. So as a graduate student, uh, I think it really doesn't hurt to uh, go into the field, talk to people that are dealing with these issues very early on because they actually have great knowledge of all these topics and might uh, definitely be able to help you in getting uh, your research started. So that's a little bit on the origins uh, of the book uh, and particularly the fisheries case that has been uh, very interesting to follow, but um, very troubling to a certain degree as well. Matt, I'm not sure if Jessica's already arrived. Yeah, Jessica is here, but uh, we, we need to move her from the attendees list to the panelist list. And uh, so we, this, might take a, this might take a technical minute to do. Um, in the what are we going to do in the meantime i'm here can you hear me hey there we go turning on my audio so we're good yep hi everyone sorry uh for the delay um i was um i was at apsa on my computer <laughs> and now i'm here <laughs> um <laughs> so um thank you matt for uh, inviting me. It's a real pleasure and honor to be able to engage with my colleague um, and uh, friend Stefan and to give a careful read to his excellent new book. Um, so Stefan has written a well 
conceived and well-researched monograph on a subject that um, has occupied a lot of my own research, um, which is private authority. And Graham and I have both published books on this. And so it's a real pleasure to read the book, Stefan's book, to see how the um, sort of research agenda has progressed over time. I'm going to focus my comments on three parts of the book. Matt, I'm not exactly sure what you said. So uh, if I'm really repeating, just cut me off. Um, uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about the theory. Um, and then I want to talk briefly about the cases of fishery and uh, fisheries and fair trade. So I think Stefan's book asks really interesting questions about liberal environmentalism, uh, the idea that markets and environmental protection are eminently compatible, and also the subject of an excellent book by one of our other colleagues at U of T, um, Stephen Bernstein. And in particular, he, he examines the phenomenon of private authority um, and when uh, governments, i.e. public authority, will intervene to guide or regulate that private authority. And he distinguishes between two forms of public intervention. Uh, governments can adopt standards or they can adopt procedural regulations. And I really like this um, splitting of the dependent variable. It's something that I do in my own work. Um, so I think that's really great and instructive um, way to add sort of more nuance and, and thought about the, about the phenomenon of private authority. So standards are, standards regulation is what he, he describes this as substantive rulemaking around production processes and how private authority communicates compliance to consumers, generally in the form of labeling. And procedural regulations are the governance procedures, so practices around how standards are set or revised. Am I totally repeating here? Should I, I'm good? Okay. So the basic argument is that different forms of intervention serve different purposes. Governments implement standards when domestic producers need a boost, uh, either to help producers enter new markets or, say, distinguish themselves from competitors. And here, I think really helpfully, Stefan argues that we can think of private regulators as a kind of interest group. And states will respond to that interest group when they are effective at communicating their demands. So governments implement procedural regulations when there's a lot of fragmentation of private authority. And so basically the proliferation of schemes makes it hard for consumers to distinguish among them. And as a result, they don't know what's high quality and what isn't. And so some, the government steps in to provide some procedural guarantees which establish a baseline of uh, quality. And that helps them overcome this information asymmetry. So Stefan has a very classical political science two by two which is excellent, um, and says that when fragmentation is high and domestic producers will benefit from differentiating their products, the state will intervene with both standards and procedural regulations. Uh, if domestic producers have this need, but there's not that much fragmentation, then there will only be standards regulation. And then conversely, if domestic producers don't have demands to differentiate, but there's still a high level of fragmentation, then we'll see only procedural uh, regulations. So I want to make a couple comments on the theory um, and then move to the cases. I really like how Stefan conceptualizes private regulators as an interest group. I think this is right on. Um, and some of my later work kind of points at this in, in different ways as well. Uh, he differentiates how they're not a traditional interest group, but in general, I think the characterization is, 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 is more, they are more an interest group than not. Um, the first generation of private authority, I think Stefan mentioned, I'm guessing earlier in his comments, focused largely on their ability to fill regulatory gaps. Um, and so the standard account of the emergence of forestry labeling is that it came into effect after the failure of the 1992 uh, Treaty on Forests at Rio. Um, and this narrative has since been refined. And I think the book does a nice job of really unpacking the material interests of the producers, as well as some of the organizational sociology of the regulatory organizations. Um, my second comment about the theory is about the variable of proliferation. And here, Stefan argues that harmonization counters problems that occur as a result of proliferation of different standards. So instead of providing information about the environmental attrib attributes of a product, too many competing labels actually muddies the waters. And so to me, this argument, as a standards nerd myself, this argument makes a lot of intuitive sense, but it's hard to know how it works in practice, I think. So 
I think a lot of the interesting politics that Stefan describes in the rich qualitative work is finding the sweet spot between adequate proliferation of private regulations that promote um, product differentiation and avoiding too much fragmentation, which creates this information asymmetry. And who decides where that sweet spot is? So for example, in the case of organic agri agriculture, the EU intervened with procedural standards to address the problem of fragmentation. But as Stefan points out, IFOM, the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements, already had basic standards in place. So it's not clear why the EU would decide that procedural regulations were needed. So if you read the account, it seems that the drive for harmonization comes less from recognized need for reducing information asymmetry and more from the prospect that iPhone could essentially have all of its rules codified into EU law through the 1991 regulation, European regulation. So that's an interest group argument, right? Um, and so for me, I wanted to know more about the tipping point that, that um, when the tipping point is reached that creates a demand for harmonization. And if that's something that's always decided by public authority rather than driven by private authority, which is kind of what I read in this case. Um, okay, I think in addition, the discussions about why governments care about fragmentation um, kind of mixes up two different logics, both of which I think are important. There's a very nice description of second order information asymmetries, increased transaction costs, which essentially reduces the value of the label. Um, but to me, this doesn't seem to be a problem for governments. It seems to be a problem for the private regulators themselves. What is a problem for governments, though, is the problem of market access. And maybe this came through more in the other two um, cases, but uh, market access and the trade distortions that you point out. So essentially, some producers are excluded de facto because they conform to some private regulations, but not the right ones, right? The, not the ones that allow them access. To me, um, this seems like a separate causal mechanism than the information asymmetry problem because, uh, and it has a different agent, right? So um, two different problems, two different mechanisms with two different agents. Um, the other issue with the trade distortions logic, if I understand it correctly, is that it is essentially the converse of the benefit, uh, benefits of product differentiation. So in other words, let me see if this comes out right. In your theory, procedural interventions address two issues, helping pr producers differentiate their products and helping producers harmonize them to make them sufficiently similar to gain market access. So I, I, this, it, these kind of hold, um, the same thing holds kind of two different spaces and I found that a little bit um, confusing. One last point on fragmentation. Are undesirable levels of fragmentation, this is again, this is another version of the sweet spot question, are they only evidenced by intervention? So how do you know when they're, you know, can you know ex ante if there's too much fragmentation? Um, okay, so let me move on to the cases. I'm not sure, I'm not keeping track of time, so you'll tell me. Um, uh, I'm gonna talk about one intervention case and one non-intervention case, organics and fisheries. Um, I'm so the basic organic story is as follows. I think a very simplified version. I'm sorry to do vi violence to your narrative, Stefan. Um, there's an increased demand for organic food in Europe, particularly in France, Germany, and the U U UK and Italy. This demand gives rise to a proliferation of standards because lots of producers want to reap the financial benefits of this new demand, and eventually the EU intervenes to create new procedural standards. But there are a couple of interesting twists in this story. First, there's the iPhone procedural standard, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but these aren't enough to solve the fragmentation problem. Second, there is this new coalition of interests in organic ag, which doesn't, agriculture, which doesn't include, you point out, the traditional organic lobby. And for you, this seems to be sort of a key part of the story that you don't have this like obnoxious traditional ag lobby involved. Um, and I wanted to know more about why that happened. Um, why didn't traditional agriculture see themselves as this, see this as an opportunity for them to extend their regulatory reach? Um, so 
the EU intervention takes this form of the 1990 regulation, which sets rules about verification and allows for delegation to private auditors, um, something also very near and dear to my heart. It allows for individual private logos alongside the EEC designation to address this asymmetry problem. So essentially, public if I understand this correctly, public authority is the backstop, right? And is, it's the label of last resort uh, under conditions of fragmentation, which to me raises the question of how important are the private labels if they're sim simply the secondary labels, right? If they all bear the EEC label, um, what is the value added of the private private authority, which again lends credence to your conceptualization of private authority as an interest group, right? The second interesting twist is the pushback from private regulators who are not happy with the amendments to the 1991 directive, which they see as too constraining. So again, it seems that the politics evolves around this elusive sweet spot where they want to, whoops, that was my cat, where they want to harmonize, um, but not too much, right? And that, and that this, this sweet spot changes as the market matures. Um, okay, so on to fisheries. Fisheries is the non-intervention, right, which seemed to be quite flustering to you because there's no neat package for the end of the chapter. Um, and the short version of this complicated story is lots of private regulations uh, of fisheries, demand for harmonization, but no public intervention yet. Um, so the first point here, again, goes back to this question of the utility of private regulations, because as you and Graham know much better than I do, uh, most private regulations on fisheries are based on the 2005 FAO technical guidelines for responsible fisheries, right? It's a public set of standards. So to me, then, it seems that by and large, uh, private authority in fisheries already has a procedural standard, right? So it, to, I wanted to know why this is considered to be inadequate or why is it, it wasn't simply just, you know, reiterated in, in this consideration of harmonization. Second, it's clear that a key consideration in the evolution of this non-intervention is the ongoing debate about the, um, the reform of the EU common fisheries policy, um, which, you, which Stefan discusses at the end of the chapter. So if I understand correctly, the goal is for the CFP, the common fisheries policy, to incorporate sustainability into its core mandate by 2020, although it has not yet done this. Um, so if that's the case, then an, EO, an eco label would be somewhat redundant, right? Because presumably there would at least be a baseline of um, sustainability that's just in the, in which signals being in compliance with EU law. So this point serves as a useful segue for my final comments um, and the bigger picture about Stefan's book. Um, so I think Stefan's book is really, um, it asks a, a clearly delineated question, uh, interesting question about the interaction between public and private authority. But lurking in the background of this question, and it's, I've definitely cherry picked from, from a lot of material in the book, but I think a serious question that's lurking in the background of the whole book is this bigger issue of what is the utility of private regulation if it requires regulation by the state? So how many of lay layers of regulation do we really need? Um, and I don't pose this as a critique of the book, but rather to show that I think it has a really interesting, you know, I think the book has really much broader implications. And if you think about where this research agenda is, is headed, I think this is, this is an, uh, you know, an obvious question that the, that the work raises. And so uh, to conclude, I, I, you know, to just play devil's advocate to answer that question, um, if the goal is to pro provide public goods, um, why do we need private actors to do this? Uh, we have, one might make arguments on the grounds of efficiency, and indeed I've done the same thing, but if regulators require public oversight, then how much efficiency is actually gained, right? So you might gain efficiency in terms of expertise, right, but then you also have this oversight. Um, and uh, I think this comes up in the biofuels chapter, um, where, and, and it's, so, let me back up and say, it raises another question, um, which is um, not only do we need public, do we need private authority to do this, but why private authority instead of some other form of regulation? So, in the in the case of biofuels, the EU was clearly motivated by an interest in um, building building up this sector, right? 
So they wanted to facilitate market access uh, for these uh, producers. So that raises the question, why do that? Like, so why regulate the regulators instead of say, just subsidizing the market directly, right? So there's an interesting, I mean, there's obviously a political answer to that, which I don't know, but I'd be interested to know kind of more about that. And the same question I think is, is uh, raised by the coda of the fisheries story, where if a, if a reformed um, common fisheries policy becomes the gold standard to which all private regulators must adhere, again, what is the, uh, what is the utility of that standard? So um, to conclude, I'll just say, I think you know, it's pretty obvious with everything that's going on in the world today, not least of which is going on in California and Oregon, that we're at a turning point for a lot of environmental problems, um, notably climate change, but certainly many others. Um, and I think Stefan's book provides really important insights into understanding whether the scarce resources of governments should be devoted to regulating something, it could simply regulate itself. So I think that Stefan might be making the argument for cutting out the middleman. And with that, I will end my comments. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Jessica. That was fascinating and, and really, really interesting. Um, so I think what we'll do is, Graham, you said you had a few questions. I want you to put your questions on the table, and then we're going to give Stefan maybe five minutes to respond to his, uh, five to six minutes to respond to his uh, interlocutors. And then, we, because I want to make sure that uh, our attendees have a chance to answer to ask their questions as well. So Graham, you want to take a minute or two to put that you said you had some questions. I just want to want you to get them on the table. Yeah, I, I certainly can. I mean, Jessica's uh, uh, opened up a whole can of worms uh, with her last uh, her last comment, um, uh, which maybe should be a central focus of the the, the commentary or the questions or the, the discussion. Um, I think that um, I, I, my sense is that, uh, or my question that I was keen for Stefan to, to, to elaborate on or answer was that the EU seems to be a place where there's a lot more, um, there have been a lot more experiments with intervention than in other uh, jurisdictions. Uh, and that leads to some potential insights into what other governments might learn from that, uh, the sort of somewhat to Jessica's point of what is the role of regulating uh, a regulator of another sort? Are there other ways to do this? So I'd just be curious whether Stefan has reflections on that lessons that might inform government regulators. Uh, because they, the EU seems to continue to experiment with these kinds of uh, interventions that don't really undermine the, the, the primary logic of uh, private authority. Uh, they do to some extent, but say the the conflict mineral rules that are coming out or coming into effect in January 2021, again, are going to be using private regulators as uh, a part of the due diligence function the EU will be, um, will be expecting companies to adhere to in relation to conflict minerals in their supply chains. So there, this is, seems to be a tool that they're turning to quite a lot. Um, so why is that? What, what is it that uh, leads to that uh, and doesn't lead to the path Jessica is sort of proposing that why not intervene in other ways? So what, is, what, is the, what explains that uh, continued continuation? Is it interest group politics where there's a lot of interest now that's developed in this field and it's become an actor much like a professional association that has influence uh, and uh, becomes uh, a place where delegation happens, or is there something else going on there? So I'll be keen to have some discussion around that. All right, Stefan, you're, uh, you've, you've heard some interesting questions and you've heard some really nice things about the contribution of the book. And so we're gonna give you some, uh, uh, a few minutes to respond before we turn it to the audience. Yeah, it's great. Thank you very much. And Jessica, thank you very much for those very insightful uh, comments and questions. Uh, too many to uh, discuss in five or six minutes. So um, I'm going to pick and choose. Um, and probably the biggest one that both of you now, uh, Graham as well, with your final comments focused on is uh, why regulate those types of regulators and what's the utility of private governance uh, in this all. And I 
I'm not sure. I have to think about it. Do I make the argument that the middleman should be cut? I'm not sure if I do, because I think the role of government, um, of public authority more generally, kind of depends on the institutional and regulatory setting that private governance is uh, operating in, uh, both in terms of issue areas or markets, but also in terms of country settings. The polity within which a private governance uh, um, operates matters. Um, and in uh, countries and regions like the EU, where there is a lot of public regulation available already, um, private governance serves a different function if public authority wants to step in. Private governance then serves a different function than in countries uh, where those types of regulations around sustainability and environmental issues are lacking or absent, and where maybe a vibrant civil society is not directly available. Um, and where uh, other types of regulations like labor laws are um, problematic as well. So I think it, it and I, I don't intend to make a claim at all about those different types of policies. And I'm very well aware, as I also discussed at the very end of the final chapter in the book, that more research as always is necessary to see to what extent this type of um, theoretical argument travels to countries and settings where uh, institutions uh, uh, are uh, more fragile and um, sustainability regulation is lacking or not as uh, developed. Um, but I do think that we have to have to remember, for, and I'm, I'm not going to go into uh, each of the cases necessarily in much detail, but I, I do think it's interesting to uh, remind uh, people that, for example, in the case of organics, there was indeed a demand from the private regulators to be regulated. They started the discussion with the European Commission in the late 1980s that, hey, there's a problem in the market. Problem in the market being there are too many unfounded claims out there. We talk about organic, but others talk about wholesome. Others talk about natural. So we want you, EU, public authority, to help us in differentiating that market and in that sense create more uh, consumer demand and more opportunities for organic farmers who have put in the effort and the cost to transform their practices to organic practices to benefit from that. And so there is a certain demand from private regulators to be regulated. And in the case of biofuels, it's a little bit of a different story, but in the end, the, um, the biofuels producers and private governance schemes uh, were in favor of some kind of regulation. And so I think that's, that's important that it's not always just public authority coming in from the outside, imposing their authority on private regulators, but that it's more of an interplay. And there, of course, the role of these private government schemes as interest groups plays, plays a role, um, a big role. Um, but in the end, I think instead of doing away with the middleman, I think they exist now. Private governance exists, private regulation exists, uh, companies, firms follow those private rules. So I think it's, 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 the focus should be on finding a good policy mix, um, taking, making use of the expertise that private governance has developed over time. And uh, you often see that, uh, for example, in the case uh, of uh, organics, um, they are leaders in terms of developing new types of regulations in new issue areas It start with uh, organic agriculture, it, it focused on wine, afterwards on aquaculture. And so they are taking first steps in moving into new areas. And they show, uh, as you and Graham actually argue in your uh, this transnational environmental law argument uh, uh, article, that they can be the front runners in that sense and show um, public policymakers what is possible, what are the types of rules that firms can actually comply with and that policymakers then can learn from and adopt uh, at a later moment uh, in time. Uh, but they should also, public policymakers should also take advantage of the expertise that private government schemes have in, co in um, compliance verification. And I think the biofuels case is problematic in many uh, respects, in the sense that the EU created uh, sustainability rules uh, on biofuels production that leave out crucial issues, such as you know, issues around land use and labor issues and food security issues. Um, and the procedural regulation that the EU has developed is problematic as well, in the sense that it's a very low bar. But overall, the design of the biofuels regime I find interesting and relevant to uh, think about more uh, for other issue areas. For example, like Ray mentioned, the conflict uh, minerals case. Because for biofuels, the EU fully integrated private governance schemes into its public policy design. 
in the sense that the EU sets standards for what sustainability for biofuels production means. And uh, the EU, the Commission, approves individual private governance schemes on the basis of do the private rules follow the public rules? Do they take the public rules as a baseline and potentially uh, even go beyond, even though we see that that's not really happening? And do the private governance schemes comply with our very minimal um, procedural rules? But if they do, they are fully integrated into the public policy in the sense that operators that want to get certified by a pr private governance regime can do so. And by doing so, if that private governance scheme has been approved by the EU, by default, they now also are in compliance with EU rules. So in that sense, I find that a very interesting um, policy design where they fully integrate uh, the private governance schemes into their design and make use of the expertise that private governance schemes have in terms of developing potentially new types of rules, um, but also using their um, compliance verification function. And it's important because that creates extraterritorial effects in the sense that biofuels producers from outside of the EU now can just go to a transnational private governance scheme, get certified by that scheme. If that scheme is approved by the EU, they now are in compliance with EU rules. And I think in that sense, the EU's rules, you could think of this as a hegemonic argument as well, has some kind of a large extraterritorial reach in this issue area. And I think that's a, that's a very clever way. And of course, there were self-interested reasons for doing it in this way uh, as well. And WWF as an interest group played a huge role in getting this type of policy design approved at the EU level. Um, but I do think it's a, it's a clever way of making use of the expertise that private government schemes have developed uh, over time. Um, now, of course, private government schemes can also uh, prevent this from happening. And uh, the case of fair trade is very interesting there, where fair trade, the fair trade movement specifically, uh, lobbied very hard to not be sucked into something like what happened to organics, or in this case, biofuels. Uh, and they succeeded. They succeeded in preventing e the EU regulating what fair trade means substantively, or creating procedural rules on how these private governance schemes should function. Nonetheless, fair trade succeeded in uh, preventing that type of EU regulation. But in, an, in another uh, issue area, public procurement, they have nicely integrated themselves into the policy design in the sense that the EU public procurement rules now allow that in a public tender, um, um, authorities mention specific labels and specific private governance programs like fair trade by name to be uh, 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 useful when looking at environmental or um, social issues uh, in public tenders for public procurement. Um, and there, again, Fairtrade lobbied very hard to have this done and to have their name as Fairtrade label in, uh, into a public tender like that. And so regulation is not only imposed, but it's also demanded to a certain degree under very specific conditions by those private regulators. And I think that's an interesting dynamic that we uh, have to be uh, aware of as well. Um, I'm not sure if I need to go into any of the other very specific comments that um, Jessica gave. Um, maybe some of those issues will come up in the Q&A and I can uh, refer back to them um, then as well. That's great. Okay, so thank you, Stefan. That's excellent. And we do have some questions from the audience. And I have a question, but I think I'll put it to all three panelists at the, at the very end. Um, so first, are there cases where both public and private authorities agree to greater regulation together? Or do you find there's usually one party that makes demands on the other? Uh, yeah, I think in the case of uh, organics, it was clearly the case that um, the demand came from both sides. And that's the origin story that is being told about uh, why the EU started regulating organics um, organic agriculture in um, the early 1990s. That story starts somewhere mid 1980s where somebody from uh, the organics movement met somebody from the European Commission and they started talking about, hey, wouldn't it be great if you could regulate this? And from the side of the private regulators, the argument was, like I mentioned, there are very um, different types of claims in the market that we want to clarify. Uh, plus this will likely lead to more money for organic farmers. If the EU officially defines what organic agriculture means, that also implies that there might be money 
that then will flow from the European budget to organic farmers. And that was very interesting for um, the organic movement to get um, their specific approach to uh, agriculture uh, more accepted. Great. Uh, second question. Um, uh, I was wondering if you can speak to the role of science in standard setting. And if we can say anything about the level of rigor across public versus private standards, private actors may be incentivized to leapfrog rigor for sake of signaling sustainability, but they also may face greater legitimacy challenge. Um, public actors may want more rigor, but limited by technical capacity and bureaucratic sluggishness. What are your thoughts on science and standards? Uh, that's a good question. It's not an issue that I looked at directly, but it does come up in some of the issue areas. And um, again, I looked at those four issue areas. I know those um, best, so uh, I'm not sure if those necessarily generalize to all uh, issue areas. But to a certain degree, Europe, the European Commission has been deferential to what private governance or what private standard setters have been doing, thinking that whatever they're doing is already science-based. In the case of organic agriculture, they dealt with uh, iPhone, which they found a very credible organization. And they thought they represent um, organic farmers from very different countries in the European context and uh, internationally as well. So we find them credible in that sense. In the biofuels case, science um, was actually a reason why um, the standards that the EU in the end adopted were relatively strict from a comparative point of view, if you look at, at the time, what type of biofuel sustainability standards had been adopted uh, in other countries. But at the same time, um, an issue like indirect land use change was a, a very uh, hotly debated issue at the time. And the science was not clear on that. Um, and that prevented the EU from um, regulating that issue and integrating uh, indirect land use change uh, in their uh, sustainability standards. So I think science and especially for the Euro European Commission, that is a very important um, baseline. But if there is uncertainty on the science, they will also not regulate. So they uh, have, uh, you know, the, the European Commission is a big bureaucracy. The, so they have the capacity to deal with all the different scientific uh, um, um, uh, looking at what the scientific consensus is and trying to integrate that into their standards doesn't mean that they always can do or that they always will um, use science as a, a baseline. For example, the EU introduced a 10% target for renewable energy, which was not based on science at all, but purely because somebody in the European Commission thought that 10% renewable energy sounded good. And there is research that um, uh, backs up that claim. Um, so science is important, but it's not the, the beginning and end of all. Great. And so now we have a question uh, from someone who's staying up very late in Copenhagen, uh, Stefano Ponte. Thanks for joining us, Stefano. Um, uh, he says, great book, Stefan. Congratulations. I have a question about area focus. Three of the schemes you looked at, fisheries, biofuels, and organics, have relatively weak social and labor content and focus mainly on environmental issues. What implications does this have for your argument? or for your analytic framework, if, if any. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, does that change my argument drastically? Well, probably the, 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 the social issues are potentially very different, uh, I think. Um, they don't feature very prominently, as you mentioned, any of, in any of these uh, areas, nor in the uh, in the way that the EU afterwards uh, tried to regulate, like in the biofuels case, uh, labor issues um, are kind of completely overlooked and not integrated at all. In the fisheries uh, case as well, what the EU was trying to do there was mainly focusing on environmental issues. Um, that led the uh, French fisheries and the French government to develop their own eco-label in fisheries where the argument was, we don't only want to look at environmental issues, but we want to look at all the three pillars of sustainability. And so that label and that program developed by the French government uh, integrates economic and social issues much more than um, the environmental uh, issues that the European Union was only going to focus on. 
Um, so empirically, I know a little bit about how social issues are mainly neglected in those issue areas. I would have to think a little bit more and do some more research on uh, labor regimes uh, focusing on these issues to see to what extent the um, uh, theoretical framework would uh, travel. I wouldn't want to make any big claims uh, about that for now. Great. Um... Uh, we have another question here from uh, Janina Grabs. Given existing doubt with respect to the reliability of auditors and certification schemes, do you believe that the integration of private governance as mechanism of extraterritorial reach of states may negatively affect states' legitimacy and credibility when regulating sustainability? So if I understand it correctly, because there are legitimacy issues with the auditors that are used, that might negatively impact legitimacy of the public regime. Is that correct? It's not my question, but I think that yes, that's what I, that's what I, yeah. That's how I understand it, right? Yeah, yeah that might very well be. He's asking, do you believe that this integration of private governance as a mechanism of extraterritorial reach can negatively affect states' legitimacy because standard setting and auditing is, is up for grabs. Janina, if I've, if, if I've uh, butchered that, I, I apologize. Just let me know in the chat and I'll, I'll rephrase. Mm -hmm. um, to, to a certain deg uh, degree, I would agree uh, with that, but these are not the only issue areas where governments use private auditors, right? And uh, Graham and I are actually um, trying to um, get ourselves into this area more looking at the role of auditors uh, in all of this. Um, and auditors are widely used, not just in the environmental uh, area, but way beyond is that on technical um, standard setting um, on social issues as well. But I think the fact that a um, government will get involved gives it inherently more legitimacy in the eye of consumers or citizens than when NGOs or firms would do it on their own, at least from a European perspective, I would say. That's what I gather from what I've read in the many um, policy documents and preparatory documents that I've read and how they think about using um, private governance and private auditors in that respect. Um, it was a big issue and it is still a, a big issue in the biofuels case where there are huge problems with the procedural rules that the uh, European Union has set. And they could have done a much better job in trying to tease out those types of problems, um, not just with the private rules that uh, are being used and whether or not the private governance schemes go beyond the minimum baseline that the EU has set, but also in terms of how they organize themselves, the types of auditors uh, that they use. Um, so I think in the eye of researchers, yes, that might negatively impact how we view them in the eye of the consumer, the purchasers of labeled products, which is not the case in biofuels, of course, but in uh, the other issue areas. I'm not sure if it does. I think if there is a public uh, logo, uh, even though people not necessarily realize that the organic logo is a public logo. So that was an issue as well that the EU should do uh, more on making it known to people that this is a public logo. And for my students here in Canada, I always point them to organics as well. And they don't know that it's actually a public logo. They just see it as a label like any other. Um, so I'm not sure if in the eye of the consumer, that would necessarily mean uh, um, less legitimacy. Great. Uh, now we have a question from Takumi Shibaki. How does the growing number of vegans slash vegetarians in Europe affect the rulemaking, especially in the areas of fisheries and organic agriculture? thinking about its impact on the demand side. Vegetarian consumers are exiting the market in the case of fisheries, but in a broader sense, they might be shifting the preferences of other fishery consumers or perhaps polarizing consumer preferences into people who care deeply about organics versus those people who don't care at all. Wow, well, that would be a great PG product, I would, a project, I would say, right? Finding that out, that's great. Um, I don't know the percentage of vegan and vegetarian people in Europe. I assume there's still a, a minority and that the uh, meat and fish consumers are still way larger. And the EU is actually the largest uh, fisheries market in terms of consumption in the world. 
So I'm not sure to what extent the, um, the rise of vegetarianism impacts this, especially because, and Jessica mentioned that, um, yes, the EU wants to become sustainable in terms of its fisheries policies. Nobody really believes that. Nobody really believes that the EU rules uh, would lead to more sustainable fishing, that lead to, will lead to more exploitation. And this is something that the European Commission has known and has warned about for two decades now, that the way that uh, especially the member states treat fisheries and Brexit is a case in point in terms of how contentious fisheries can be, um, is that they're basically ruining uh, all the stocks that are still available and that uh, the new rules will not lead to a sustainable uh, fisheries policy. Hence, would also uh, implies that when private governance schemes take the EU rules as a baseline, that that will definitely not be enough. And the only uh, institution in the European Union that somewhat focuses on that, but also um, less and less uh, with time, is the European Parliament. Uh, the European Parliament is very strong and uh, strongly in favor of a EU public certification scheme and label based on rules that would go beyond uh, the current uh, common fisheries policies rules. Um, none of the other institutions, none of the other interest groups had any interest in doing this. And that's why it's still in flux because the European Parliament now has co-decision uh, power in fisheries uh, since the uh, Treaty of, uh, of Lisbon. And so that, that creates some kind of a um, push and pull between the Commission and the Council on the one hand and the Parliament on the other hand, but nobody really believes that the uh, fisheries policy will be sustainable according to what the science would like to tell us. Um, but again, it would be a great uh, project to look at how uh, not just in the EU, but also elsewhere, vegan and vegetarianism would uh, impact us. All right, so now one of, one of the co-directors of the EGL, Stephen Bernstein, wants to stir the pot a little bit. He says, you've been very, very kind in your answers, talking about previous work on private authority. Um, but what does your work tell us about how previous work on private authority got it wrong? And you have two, two of your fellow panelists there have been working on private authority. So you know, spice it up here a little bit on Friday afternoon. What does your work tell us about how previous work on private authority got it wrong and why your corrections are important correctives? Oh, um, that's, a, that's a very difficult question, obviously, and I don't want to create any enemies on what's supposed to be a happy event as a book launch. <laughs> um, one thing that I point out in the book, um, I don't think it's because Jessica was wrong. It was just an extension of her model uh, because in her model, she uh, distinguishes between delegated authority, dele delegating public tasks to private actors. And in the absence of that, entrepreneurial private authority might emerge, which is close to the, the types of private governance schemes that I'm talking about. Um, in the cases that I, that I looked at, uh, those two types of authorities merged in the sense that uh, the EU, for example, like the case of biofuels that I uh, explained, the EU delegates public tasks, compliance verification in this case, to private governance schemes, entrepreneurial authority. So in that sense, the two um, options or the two uh, types of authority uh, merge and uh, the EU delegates to entrepreneurial private authority. Um, taking a, a more bird's eye perspective, um, I think private governance scholars, and that doesn't necessarily come from my work, um, but points to other uh, types of work as well, and does not only relate to the role of public authority, but the fact that private governance was hailed as the biggest thing since sliced bread somewhere in the 90s and early 2000s. And we've seen that that has not um, played out well. And other people who are doing uh, research on impacts of private governance, for example, Janine Grabs, um, she has a great book out on uh, looking at what those impacts of private governance mean. And do they actually lead to on the ground environmental sustainability improvements? And she finds that that's not necessarily the case. And she also focuses on that interaction with public and private governance and that there is something to be said that when private governance cannot do a great job, there is actually a role for public governance and for public rules um, in terms of a sort of layering of rules around sustainability. Um, but largely, did 
does you know consumerism uh, with regards to buying more uh, eco labels um, the market incentives that are uh, crucial to uh, private governance has that changed the way that we produce and consume absolutely not so everybody who has ever hailed private governance as the big new thing that will change everything that has not played out uh, I don't think that there are many people that uh, actually thought that this would happen because that would basically mean an overall of the capitalist production consumption system, uh, which none of us have a good blueprint for how that could actually work. So given that we are with faulty and uh, imperfect private governance and imperfect public governance, we're going to have to make do with what we have. And in the end, I think that having public legislation, public rules in place is always better than any private governance can ever do. But given that private governance exists, I think finding a good policy mix might be a better step uh, in the direction of somewhat more sustainable production and consumption than purely relying on private governance and market incentives uh, on their own. It was very diplomatic, Stefan, very diplomatic. Um, so actually, I want to wrap up the Q&A session with, with a, a question to all three panelists because we have three of the sort of foremost experts on private authority with us. We're also in the middle of, and maybe I'm just too affected by all the pictures from California, but we're in the middle of a crisis. Is the interaction of the sort of interplay of public authority and private governance, uh, how do I put this? Is it uh, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic? Or is this interaction built to help us move in the directions that we need to do at the speed we need to do um, in a crisis? And you know, and uh, this isn't a, a critique of any study of of private governance, as you know, I've been studying non-public governance of climate change for a long time myself. But this, the the speed at which the impacts of a of the sustainability crisis, especially around climate seem to be catching up to us makes me wonder if if our governance the governance models that we have are adaptable to crisis <clears throat> well i'll go first and then i'll uh, defer to my more senior colleagues um i think it relates to the previous point that i made um that no none of this will um work quick enough to actually deal with the problems at hand. Um, not public rules on their own, because there are certain entrenched interests, but as I found in my research, private governance equally creates vested interests in uh, a status quo that is very hard to overcome. And building of coalitions um, is very important and interesting, but very difficult as well. And trying to align public and private interest is difficult when you just deal with creating public legislation, but it's uh, even more difficult if you want to somehow try to merge public and private rules into a coherent whole to deal with a issue where timing is of the essence. So I think that um, it's very hard to have any positive outlook uh, in that respect to be, to be fair. Graham or Jessica? I, I mean, I can go or you can go, doesn't matter. Okay. Um, uh, are we rearranging the deck chair as well? In many ways we're doing that, not just in, <laughs> in terms of, of private authority. I, I think, so for me, um, uh, is it adaptable? I think, you know, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic for, I think, three reasons. One, um, I see, uh, well, one is goes to Stefan's book, right? If you believe that um, these are interest groups, then you should be really concerned about private authority because um, they are making regulations, um, sometimes regulations that kind of evolve into public regulations, and there's not a huge amount of accountability. So that's, that's one concern. Um, second, you know, it, it, um, 
functions as, as Stefan said on this model of, of sort of sustainable consumption, which I think we all know is not a real thing um, in, in at least in wealthy, uh, high emitting, highly consuming countries. Um, and third, I mean, I think there's just a sort of larger um, kind of theoretical or um, political issue, which I tried to raise in my comments, which is, you know, the state, it, it, the idea of private authority, while there may be functional benefits to outsourcing certain things to experts, although we have to be wary about those because of their own vested interests, is fundamentally premised on the notion of a minimally interventionist state. And that is not what we need right now. We need the opposite. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it, it, so the response, I think what I really, you know, latched onto in, in this in thinking about um, when the public intervenes is one of the sort of hallmarks of neoliberalism is complexity, right? So we have this increasingly complex um, set of systems and in, in this case um, you know so this very dense web of institutions and now we have this like layers upon layers of regulation when sometimes you know the answer doesn't need to be that complicated it's actually really simple I mean politically it may be complicated but um, to create um, to deal with that political com 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 those political challenges, by obfuscation through regulatory complexity doesn't seem to be a recipe for success, if that makes sense. That's it. Graham? I, I struggle with these questions because I, whenever I hear this kind of question, I, my brain always goes to the, the messy details and um, I struggle with coming up with a nice clean um, answer, other than it, I see it as it depends. Um, and that's partly because I know like some cases I just think of and I think that, yeah, so if we did away with private governance in certain cases, um, we, it, no one's really thought that through around like what the implications of that are because we, that isn't, that actually isn't a question someone's actually answered. Like what, what does the absence of this look like in relation to what the state would do, right? Um, so you know, the, the forestry case, I think one of the mo main motivations early on was because the state had had this, this system in place for decades that was essentially decimating the world's forests. And that was occurring in the tropics, that was occurring in uh, North America, you know, the province that I grew up in, there was just systematic uh, failure on the part of the state to oversee a regime that was actually doing something that was pro uh pro social pro good public interest with a resource so i think certification has to be understood in that context right that it has to be understood as a reaction to a particular moment in history that marked uh, a perception that something wasn't working and we should try something else that's not to say that we should continue on supporting it and saying that it's rah 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 it's great but to lose sight of that, that there was a kind of a, um, a dis disequilibrium that led to a particular set of experiments that thought that this path might lead to something more uh, beneficial, um, I think does a dis uh, disservice to those people who invested their entire careers to making this instrument try to work, right? Um, that, that we now know a lot more in hindsight when we look back that some of the, lo uh, the logics of it have played out in ways that we hadn't, that, that those people who started these things hadn't really anticipated. So where does that leave us now and what does that mean? Uh, I still think that, I, I mean, I wish that uh, we could answer Jessica's question and say, yes, let's get a state that does all these things exactly as we would uh, imagine it. But if we, that's our counterfactual, right? That, that I just, that that isn't a that's a social mobilization question that's like a, a public in the street um activism all these different paths of influence that we need to be thinking about right electoral processes etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, my my own thought on this is that private governance much like stefan is is here 
they are now interests, they are actors. And I would, I think that to Stefan's point about the auditors, I just like one little point, right, that I think really drives it home. The, the Marine Stewardship Council, which is a, a major program in the space, has a staff of something around the, uh, the order of 150 people, right? runs an office out of London. It's a well-resourced private regulator, um, probably one of the most well-resourced. Um, the auditors that audit for uh, the Marine Stewardship Council, um, you know, operate in 150 countries, have staff, operational staff of 170,000, right, individuals. So it's almost like we're, we're, it's, it's a miraculous that these organizations actually have the teeth that they do, do in some respects because they're, they, they don't have very many, they don't have much in the way of resources. So uh, I, I, I guess the, the question for me, it's always more a question of, well, what are, if we have a vision of where we need to go, what are the different ways we get there? And there probably are different paths. Um, and in some sectors, maybe private regulation actually plays uh, a, a helpful role in that path. And I think Stefan's book is exactly the kind of analysis that helps us understand that, right? It helps us to understand the kinds of paths that might help us. Um, not to say that those are going to get us there as quickly as we, we might want them to, but it, at least we can identify the ways in which, given the, the context in which we operate right now, what are the pathways forward? Because I think to come back to this sort of this point about well, what, what, why doesn't the state just regulate? I mean, the, I mean, unless we do away with the trade regime, and unless we completely uh, shift the way we think about process-based regulation uh, in other jurisdictions, it's very hard to imagine. That's why the EU intervenes in these odd ways with like due diligence mechanisms and supply chains. That's why the the Lacey Act is the only mechanism that the U.S. has at, at play to deal with illegal logging, right? So I, I guess unless those structural change things change, which maybe they will, um, this is sort of where we are, right? And that, like, how do we essentially try to understand the best case scenarios in that context? That's, I, I kind of ended more provocatively than I started. So sorry about that. But not only did you end up more provocatively, you you actually ended on the most optimistic of the three of the three responses. And so, I think I'm going to not ask you guys any more questions because it's Friday afternoon, and I think ending on a cautiously optimistic. And and I think that that's actually the lesson of Stefan's book is that you know, let's not get wildly excited about private governance schemes. Let's understand. Let's also not think that the state's going to swoop in and save us, but there are conditions under which the state is going to, to interact with these things. There's going to be false starts, there's going to be pathways that don't go in the right direction, but there's at least an understanding how these things interact, we can start to tease out the kind of pathways that, that Graham was talking about there, and hopefully do so relatively quickly. So with that, um, we've come to the end of the intellectual aspect of this, of this book launch. Normally now I would be inviting you all into Wait, the what? next room. We're gonna, hold on, we got a plan. Normally I'd be in, inviting you into the next room. There'd be a stack of books. I think all of you've got the poster for the, to order the book with a, with a steep discount. I hope you all do. It's an excellent book. Um, but in, we're, we're, the pandemic had other, other plans for us. And so we're all sitting like, literally I'm about 50 yards away from Jessica, just in a, a, you know, a different basement. Um, but what we'd like to do is uh, give a, a toast to Stefan and to congratulate him. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna give everybody literally a minute to two to go if you want, obviously I'm not advocating drinking, but if you'd like to go grab something that you can, can raise, if any of the presenters want to do that. And also we're going to ask that the uh, chat function be turned on for the attendees, not just the panelists, and so that they can uh, pass along a, a well wish um, to, to, to Stefan as well. So I will be back in 
in 30 seconds. And I just got the note that the, the chat function is now available for all attendees. If you want to pass along a note of congratulations to Stefan, I'll be back in 30 seconds with a toast. Go. We should probably wait till Stefan comes back for the toast. This is what I love about Zoom is all the awkward silences. It's nice to see all the congratulations in the chat function. Yeah, so Stefan, the, the chat function is filling up with uh, uh, congratulations. I very much appreciate that. Unfortunately, I cannot respond because exactly now my keyboard decided to not function anymore and I have to restart my computer apparently to make it work again. Well, you can, you'll be able to do so verbally. So, so I thank everybody for their congratulations yeah, so and for the excellent questions as well. And in the meantime, I'll pour myself a nice Belgian beer. There you go. So. Stefan, congratulations on an excellent book. It generated a great conversation and we, we think it's gonna to make great contributions and be discussed widely in many different venues. And so congratulations, thank you for giving us an opportunity to celebrate you. Yay, thank you very much, Mara. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Congratulations. That feels good doing this during a pandemic nonetheless. <laughs> so I'm very happy that we could do this. Yeah, and thanks to Matt for organizing and to Daria. This went, went seamlessly. Yeah, you missed We have to make it up at the beginning, but. Uh, off, so. <laughs> seamlessly for Zoom. Better, better, than, better, better than, than my APSA panel, which got Zoom bombed today. So. Nice. Yeah. So, Stefan, you can see the chats, though, right? I do. Yes, I see the chats. Absolutely. I just cannot respond. That's fine. Mm. Unfortunately. Yeah. This was fantastic. Yes. Are you get Are you going to do any other events, Stefan? Um, I'm going to present my book in your class, I guess, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> and then just one plug: December 10 at uh, 9 a.m. Toronto time. I'm doing a webinar with the um, University of Leuven's Global Governance Center. Um, talk is organized by uh, Axel Marx. So I'll be doing a, a presentation on my book there as well, which will be um, taped and be available on their website afterwards as well. Nice. All right. So I'm going to, I guess we're, we're going to sign off. Lots of really nice congratulations in there. Absolutely. Ron, have a great weekend. Enjoy your beer. And, Thank you very uh, much. Thanks, Matt. We'll, we'll great see you. Thank you so much, Jessica and Green, for your comments, Matt. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> have a good one. Yeah. Right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.